...valuable and functional and productive and valuable to God. He was still important and significant to God. And that's a word for about 475 of you in here tonight who have been dropped and dumped, dismissed, discarded, left behind, and kicked to the curb. Don't you ever tie the meaning and the value of your life and your experiences to the conflicts and opinions and attitudes that other people have about you. Don't let them prognosticate about your future because your meaning, your significance, your value ought not be determined by them. It ought to be determined by him. When people see you as useless, God sees you as useful. You are significant to God. You are meaningful to God. You are loved by God. You are cherished by God. You are valuable to God. Have I got any radical saints in the house tonight? Look at your neighbor like you got attitude and say, I am still valuable to God. See, I, I might not be valuable to you, but I am still valuable to God. And how valuable are you? You are valuable enough for God to still wake you up in the morning, for God to still breathe breath in your body, for God to still keep you alive, for God to still keep you moving, for God to keep the malignant forces at bay that want to destroy you. You are still valuable to God. This man was left for dead, and he was as good as dead in the minds of those who dumped him, dropped him, discounted him, discarded him, and dismissed him. He was easy prey for any predator who wanted to take him out, and yet he remained alive. God kept the vultures, the lions, the bears, the wolves, the snakes, the hyenas away from him. In the absence of appropriate sunscreen, God protected him from sunstroke. God kept him alive. And I wonder, is there anybody in here tonight who is not ashamed to testify that God kept you alive when you were in a weakened condition. You, you ought to go on and testify. Look at your neighbor say, God kept me alive. See, God kept you from opportunistic entities that wanted to capitalize on your vulnerability. God protected you from all the hoochie mamas and the gold diggers. God protected you from all the pimps and the sugar daddies. God kept you from so that the blazing heat of adversity didn't take you out. And why did he do it? He did it because you matter. He did it because you're important. He did it because you're significant. He did it because you have purpose. He did it because he ain't through with you yet. He did it because there's rhyme and reason to your life. If you ever again doubt your importance or your value, all you've got to do is look back over your shoulder and see what God has already brought you through and kept you from look over your shoulder and remember when nobody thought you would make it and if the truth be told you doubted your own survival and yet God kept you in the midst of it all because you are somebody special Oh, I wish y'all felt that tonight. You look at your neighbor right now. Look him right now and say, you ain't never seen nothing like this. I, I am special to God. I am valuable to God. I am one of a kind. When he made me, he broke the mold. And you don't have to appreciate me, but I am a gift to somebody. This man had been wounded, he had been dropped, he had been abused, he had been mistreated, he had been talked about, lied on, looked over, kicked to the curb, disrespected, left for dead, but God kept him alive. And that's somebody's testimony in here tonight. You're looking at your life saying, my haters said I was finished, my enemies thought I was gone, my critics said I didn't matter, they did everything they could to hurt me and destroy me, but some way, somehow, God kept me alive. I must be somebody special See, being left for dead, being left for dead doesn't mean you have to die. That God is keeping you alive because you are important to God. You have value, you have meaning, and you have significance. God, don't go And I'm not going to keep you long tonight. If you have your scriptures, I want to invite your attention to the 19th chapter of the gospel according to Luke. I want to read in your hearing 
out of the contemporary English version of the Bible, verses 39 and 40. And this is what the Word of God says. Some Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, make your disciples stop shouting. But Jesus answered, If they keep quiet, these stones will start shouting. And all the people said, Amen. As you go to your seat, just look at somebody and say, I can't shut up. Amen. I can't shut up. Every one of us has a story to tell. Your story is not like mine and mine is not like yours. The cover, the contents, and the chapters may appear similar, but there is a uniqueness, a particularity to all of our stories that sets it apart from everybody else's. Smile at that neighbor again and say, I've got a story of my own neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, see, our stories are distinct and dynamic because nobody has gone through exactly what you have gone through. Nobody has been challenged in precisely the way that you have been challenged. Nobody has had to struggle specifically in the way that you have struggled. Nobody's fight has been explicitly like your fight. Nobody has had to bear the particular cross that you have had to bear. And that's why nobody is more qualified than you to offer your praise and to tell your story. There are elements of our story that distinguish it from everybody else's because the moment that you trusted Christ for salvation and deliverance, that decision alone definitively defined your destiny in an exceptional and extraordinary manner. In that moment, metaphorically speaking, you were washed in the blood of the Lamb, baptized by the Spirit into the fellowship of faith and are now being filled with the Spirit on on a day-to-day -day basis. In that moment, you became a part of a unique and uncommon fellowship. Peter, writing to the early Christians in the first century in 1 Peter 2, 9, points out that we are a chosen nation, a holy priesthood, a peculiar people, a people belonging to God. And then he offers up our purpose statement, our rising diatra, our mission statement, if you will, when he says, we are here that we might show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. We are different from everybody else. Not better, but definitively, deliberately, and definitely different. Go and smile at somebody and say, you ain't never seen nothing like this. Amen. Eh? Yeah, see, we are different, that we are different. There, there is a uniqueness that contours the character of those that trust in Christ. There is a distinction that defines those that declare their faith in Christ. And if you name the name of Jesus, I should be the first one to tell you that there should be something different, something dissimilar, something distinctive about you. There should be some attribute or aspect, verity or value, feature or factor that sets you apart from everybody else. And I believe that one of the crucial characteristics that ought to distinguish us, that ought to be communicated through our conduct and our conversation is the story we have to tell. We are not to be sullen, not to be sober, not to be silent when it comes to our story. We are not to hide our our light or to keep our stories to ourselves, we are to tell somebody else. People of faith are identified by their story, and that is a story that must be told. In fact, the hymn writer of Psalm 107 in verse 2 instructs us with intentionality, saying, Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Stop right there, because the verb in that sentence is say, while the subject of the verb 
word is the redeemed, which is to suggest that it is not everybody's responsibility to say so. It is only the responsibility of the redeemed. I need you to smile at your neighbor and say, you do not have the right to remain silent. See? No, 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 no. See, silent affirmation is not an option if you've been redeemed. Voiceless verification is not an alternative if you've been redeemed. We've got a story to tell. Our story is not to be hidden, covert, cryptic, or clandestine. We are to tell it. It cannot and should not be kept under wraps or live on the DL. We are to tell it because our story needs Needs to be heard. Perhaps one of the greatest indictments on us as contemporary people of faith in this particular historical moment is that we are way too silent about way too many things that we are reeling as a nation amid irrational gun violence and we are silent. Our criminal justice system is desperately in need of reform and recalibration and we are silent. Our educational system is under supported by parents, snubbed by the community and marginalized by some who lead in that system and we are silent, untouched, untutored and untaught far too many of our young people are being caught up in the net of arrest and incarceration reducing their chances at success in life and we are silent 23 percent of all the children born in our country are born mired in poverty in the richest country in the world and we are silent epidemic and pandemic diseases environmental toxins have ravaged entire communities across our country and we are silent. More than 35 million people have died from AIDS since the disease was discovered. And just for the record, that's more than three times the total number of people who were killed in the Holocaust. And we are silent in this hour of global unrest and political stupidity and national challenge and economic polarity. We need to open up our mouths and speak up. See, now, admittedly, admittedly, I understand there are those who want us to shut up, who want us to keep quiet and stay in the sacramental space that they have subscribed for us. I don't mind telling you that not a month passes, Pastor, that I don't receive at least one email, one text, or one letter from some well-intentioned person suggesting that I ought to shut up about what's going on and what's going down. Now, the wording is is uh, various, but the message is always similar, that what they're trying to say to me is, just preach Jesus, preacher. Just preach the Bible. Talk to us about heaven, preacher, and leave economic, social, political, educational, geo-global, and market ideology alone. Just preach Jesus, preacher. Just preach the Bible. Leave politics to the politicians. Leave justice to the local police counties and magistrates leave children languishing in homes that have disintegrated leave individuals trapped in the tombs of their own personal addictions just preach Jesus preacher just preach the Bible don't mess with our behavior or scrutinize our business or release our captives or challenge us to change or shut up about our money and our habits and our choices and our proclivities and our our homes and our crises and our consequences don't bother us with your high ideals impossible dreams and incredible stand just preach Jesus preacher just preach the Bible but have you read it lately because the Bible says let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. The Bible says, cry loud and spare not. Raise your voice like a trumpet. The Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to what? To preach the gospel. To who? To the poor. The recovering of sight to the blind. The release of the captives and the acceptable year of the Lord. There are those who want to 
us to shut up. But what they don't understand, particularly about us, whom nature has kissed through the sun and turned our skin brown, is that our very existence is tied to our refusal to shut up or to be quiet. Our, our sanity and our survival have been tied to our unwillingness to shut up as individuals and when we get together to shut up as the church. If it had not been for the church, now I know I'm living in a day of non-institutional spirituality where people say, give me Jesus, but keep the church. But before you throw the church away, let me talk to you. If it had not been for the church, do you not know? No, we would have lost our natural minds attempting to navigate the nastiness of racism, sexism, bias, and prejudice. It was the church that helped us to heal on a psychological, biological, and spiritual level and move forward as people who held any hope in the future of living whole and redeemed lives. When we had no access to psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists or counselors, it it was in the church that somebody would stand behind an old wooden pulpit and remind us that Jesus was a heart fixer and a mind regulator. While we were struggling, just trying to figure it out, it was somebody in the church who would say to us, while you trying to figure it out, he's already worked it out. Historically, when we were denied the opportunity to matriculate in certain institutions of higher learning, it was the church that in sure that our ancestors learn to read, write, and exercise their intuitive and creative intelligence. It was the church, my friend, that organized and originated Fisk and Howard, Hampton and Spelman, Morehouse, Tuskegee, Dillard, and Virginia Union. If the church had been silent and never lifted its voice or its organizational hand to put those institutions together, then Charles Hamilton Hughes Houston would never have taught at Howard Law, and if Charles Hamilton Houston had never taught at Howard Law, then he would have never had a student matriculate there by the name of Thurgood Marshall. And if Thurgood Marshall had never matriculated there, he could have never taken a case, Brown versus Board of Education, in 1954 in Topeka, Kansas, and argued it all the way to the Supreme Court. If the church had been silent, a student named Martin Luther the King Jr. could never have attended Morehouse because Morehouse would not have existed and the entire world would have never been challenged to live up to his dream. There are those who want us to shut up, but we can't shut up because we've been talking for way too long. As we track the trail of the text for the night, there were those back in the day who wanted Jesus and his followers to shut their mouths and to be quiet. In the text, Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem, that high, holy, wealthy, erudite, and sophisticated religious epicenter. But notice that before he went to Jerusalem, the text says he decided to take a detour and stop in a place called that page. And it's there that the text verse, the first reason that we can't shut up. I can't shut up because we, Jesus is a savior who recognizes my potential. Go and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I may not look like it tonight, but I have a lot of potential. Yeah, let me explain, let me explain. Beth Hedge is on the southeast side of the city of Jerusalem. He had to make a stop in the hood before he went downtown. He had to come to a place that was broken before visiting a place that was assumed to be blessed. Now, if you trace the etymology of that name, Beth Pedge, it means literally the house of unripe figs. Figs were a source of ancient income. People bought and sold fig plants for a living. But Beth Pedge was an entire community known for its unripened figs. figs that were not economically viable because their potential had 
not been fully released. Can I talk to somebody? Because over one trillion dollars will pass through the African American community this year. We know how to buy stuff, but we need to be reminded that we also know how to build stuff. That we are not just consumers, we are creators and producers. We have that caliber of potential. Beth Pedge was an economically depressed community, and yet Jesus stops amid the depressed before engaging those with whom he was supposed to be impressed. He stopped by Beth Pedge because there was promise there. There was potential there. There was possibility there. It just needed to be nurtured. And can I talk to somebody in here now who knows that there is more to you than people have become accustomed to? I came all the way to Brooklyn and I just encourage you to stay connected and keep on growing because your season is coming. You have potential. You have talent. You have gifts. You have ability. I don't care what anybody tells you. Stop trying to get out of the hood. Go on and buy the hood and make the hood into what it's supposed to be. See, God has given everybody something. It just needs to be developed. You may have been last on the list, limited in capacity and ability, but don't permit the situation to dampen your motivation. Your season is coming because we serve a Savior who always stops by Beth Hedge before he goes to Jerusalem. We serve a Savior who is always willing to minister on the margin before he steps to the center. I can't shut up because Jesus recognized my potential, but the text suggests in a sideways fashion, he also remedied my pain. Jesus stopped by Bethpage, but then he continued his journey to a place called Bethany. Everybody say Bethany. Bethany means house of affliction. He stopped and stepped into the lives of people who were afflicted and in pain physically, economically, and socially. He visits people struggling and ruined before he visits people who are well resourced. Jesus stopped at the two places that nobody wanted to stop. Everybody knew about them, but nobody was really concerned about them. Everybody wanted to keep them off the map and out of the conversation. But Jesus made them significant and brought them to the center. And that's what I like about Jesus, that all the people we don't like, he loves. And all the people we want to keep in a corner, Jesus said, y'all just come with me. He even invited a dying thief to join him with, on a paradise opportunity. And that's why I love Jesus. And as the church, remember, we are called to be like him. Not like Madison Avenue, not like a billionaire want to be president, but we are called to be like Jesus. We are an extension of Jesus. The call on our lives is to identify with and continue doing in the now what Jesus did in the then. We must be willing to work in death pitch and turn potential into reality and minister in Bethany to transform affliction into ability. No matter what your pain tonight, I came to tell you Jesus can handle it. If you got a burden you can't bear, a mystery you can't solve, a dilemma you cannot remedy, a mountain you can't move, a sickness you can't heal, a bill you can't pay, a battle you can't fight, a burden you can't bear, I dare you to give it to Jesus. Jesus. He hears every prayer. He answers every groan. He can calm any calamity. He can move any mountain. Just give it to Jesus. I can't shut up because Jesus remedied my pain. Jesus stopped in the hood to give them a hookup before showing up 
in the sanctuary. But hold on, you got to see this. He stops in the hood to give them a hookup. And then he says, I want y'all to go find me a coat. But not just any coat. I want a coat that has never been written. So that before I go into Jerusalem, I can ride on that coat. I can't shut up because Jesus recognized my potential. He remedied my pain and he released my possibility. Go find me a coat that had never been written. Now, most of us read right past that line, but the only coats that had never been written were the coats who had been colonized. Y'all missed that. The only coats that had never been written were the donkeys that had been domesticated, who had been tied up. I want you to go find me a colonized coat, a coat that has been tied up its whole life, a coat that has been incarcerated, a coat that has never realized its potential and cannot see its possibility because it's been tied up so long. I want you to untie him so that I can free him for the purposes of Almighty God. I wish I had a lot of time because some of us have been tied up for so long that we can't even imagine what it's like to fully be free. Go on, shake your name and say, you're going to get free tonight. See, because the good news about Jesus is that he is a savior willing to step into any situation and get you untied and get you untangled. And I know I've got at least 37 witnesses in here tonight who can testify that the Lord untied you from something or somebody that was keeping you from reaching your full potential. So in the text, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he stops in the hood to give him a hookup. He stops to set free a domesticated donkey. And in each situation, as he's doing what only Jesus can do, people get excited and start to follow him and what would people who would not normally be on their way to the holy city not normally be en route to a sanctified synagogue and this is powerful because that's what church is all about it is the mission of the church to help people realize their potential tap somebody on your right say that's why we're here it is the mission of the church to minister to people in their affliction and help them seize their ability. Tap somebody on your left. Say, that's why we're here. It is the mission of the church to untie people who have been tied up sometimes for their entire life. Sojourner Truth was able to ask, ain't I a woman? Because she was connected to Christ who ministers to people in their affliction. Frederick Douglass was able to urge President Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation because he was connected to Christ who empowers people to realize their potential and that's our mission Jesus and this crowd of misfits from the margin are making their way to Jerusalem and they're praising God because when God has helped you realize your potential when God has released your possibility when God has remedied your pain you feel like making some noise they're making noise and some of the Pharisees rise up and want them to shut up. In fact, in the text, they tell Jesus, make them shut up. They're making too much noise. They're stirring up stuff. They're messing up the status quo. Shut up because if you keep on shouting, somebody might get free. Shut up because if you keep on shouting, some walls might begin to fall down. Shut up because if you keep on praising God, things will change in Brooklyn. And if they change in Brooklyn. They'll have to change in Queens. And if they change in Queens, they'll have to change in the Boogie Down Bronx. And if they change in the Bronx, they'll have to change in Harlem. And if they change in Harlem, we can get them to change in Manhattan. We can't shut up. 
Can I encourage some silent saint in the sanctuary? Don't you shut your mouth. Shake your neighbor and say, open your mouth. We've got children to raise. We've got families to build. We've got churches to construct. We've got communities to renew. We've got a generation to lift up. Don't you shut your mouth. We've got things to do and places to go and people to meet. God has given us a call and we can't shut up. Now there's always a Pharisee subtext. There's always a Pharisee nearby. There's always somebody who thinks they know your entire tradition from just the sound bite. Somebody who thinks you too loud, you too boisterous, that you ought to be quiet and stay in your place because you upsetting people. You don't belong here. We had you tied up in Bethpage. We had you broken down in Bethany. This is Jerusalem here. You got to have decorum up in here. You supposed to be dignified when you walk in Jerusalem, just like John. They began to talk to Jesus in the Lance Watson version of the text and said, Jesus, if you want to get in our club, you might need to sift through your disciples because you got some thugs and single parents with you. You got the addicted and the afflicted with you. You got the poor and illiterate with you. You ain't got the right kind of people. If they would just clean themselves up and keep their mouths shut, we might let y'all in the club. But thank God for Jesus who said, I ain't coming to be in your club. I'm not part of the club. I'm coming to start a movement. I'm starting something that's so different that everybody can be a part of it. Whether you're a woman or a man, whether you're from Brooklyn or from Manhattan, whether you're black or white, whether you're gay or straight, whether you got a PhD or a JD, whether you got a GED or an MD, whether you got no D at all, I'm starting a movement and everybody is invited. Whosoever will, let him come and that's why we can't shut up because God has included us God has delivered us God has saved us God has protected us we can't shut up I like what Jesus said he said if they shut up the rocks will cry out now I don't know about you but a rock is an inanimate object which is to suggest that Jesus was saying that if living things will not do what they ought to do, then I'll make inanimate things do what the living things should be doing. And I'm like my ancestors. I don't want no rock to cry out for me. I've got a mouth. I'm going to use it. I've got hands. I'm going to wave them. I've got feet. I'll walk for him. I've got eyes. I can see what he's done for me. I've got a nose. I can inhale his goodness. I've got taste buds. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm not going to let a rock cry out for me. I can't shut up. I'm not going to shut up. You can't be quiet because God has been too good to you. God has done too much for you, for you to shut your mouth. Is there anybody here who agrees with me tonight? Then tap your neighbor and say, I can't shut up. God has blessed me. And so I've got to give him praise. Praise that says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I missed it back. I'll play it again. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. You still didn't get it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. For the Lord is good.